Those of you who may keep up with the TraumaCast know that we've already had our two guests today give an excellent TraumaCast just a few weeks ago on the topic of ultrasound, and today we're going to follow that up with some demonstration and some videos and kind of get in a little bit deeper and allow for some uh, questions and answers. Our guests today are uh, Dr. Charity Evans, who is at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and Charity will talk about uh, use of ultrasound in the trauma bay and kind of the early phases of resuscitation. And then Benji will talk about uh, ICU and specifically talk about the uh, HTEE uh, continuous uh, echocardiography probe that we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, speaking of that, I'd like to uh, thank and acknowledge IMACOR. Uh, this uh, both the TraumaCast and this webinar were made possible by a generous educational grant from IMACOR. They are the makers of the HTEE probe. But uh, just to reassure you, they, we had full control over the uh, content of this, and IMACOR was gracious enough to just kind of let us run wild with our opinions about ultrasound, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, we can all uh, thank them if we see them at the different meetings and stuff. So uh, big thanks to IMACOR. Um, uh, Joe uh, Hage, I, I hope I'm saying that right, Joe. If it's not, I apologize, but he's the VP of Customer Engagement. He was brave enough to put his own email up there for everyone to see. If you have questions, comments, concerns, or would like to find out more, please give him a call. Uh, this uh, web link there, that imacorinc.com, also has tons and tons of uh, educational resources if you want to go in and uh, look through it on your own. Well, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Charity and uh, let you go ahead and take it away, Charity. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. And hello, everyone. My name is Charity Evans. I'm an EAST member and also an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in trauma, critical care, and emergency general surgery here in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, as mentioned, today we're going to discuss beyond fast ultrasound use in the trauma bay, um, followed by use in the ICU and other areas of the hospital. In order to best demonstrate some of the use of ultrasound, I recorded both my friend and colleague, Dr. Wes Zieger, he's one of the ER physicians here, at Nebraska Medicine, um, utilizing FAST and extended FAST. Our hope in doing that in, in by showing you some of the videos is that we can better illustrate some of the skills needed for FAST and for eFAST. So let's go ahead and we'll get started. FAST, um, I think as everyone knows, is an acronym for Focused Assessment with Sonography and Trauma and has really become synonymous with bedside trauma or bedside ultrasound in trauma. The FAST exam per ATLS protocols usually performed immediately after the primary survey, sometimes concurrently with the primary survey of ATLS. It is the ideal imaging um, that is imaging modality because it can be performed simultaneously with other resuscitative care, um, providing the vital information without the time delay caused by both x-rays and by CT. It does give us that rapid information for us to be able to make those decisions. The concept behind FAST exam is that many life-threatening injuries are going to cause bleeding and trauma and that it's usually that hemorrhage that's going to cause um, the hemodynamic instability that we see in our trauma patients. And although ultrasound is not 100% sensitive for identifying all bleeding, it is pretty good at recognizing the intraperitoneal bleeding in the hypotensive patient who needs an operative intervention like an emergent laparotomy or for diagnosing those cardiac injuries from penetrating injuries or from penetrating trauma that is also causing, like I said, the instability. Recently, research studies have shown that bedside ultrasound is equivalent to or perhaps even better than chest radiography for identifying the hemothorax or pneumothorax in trauma patients. For this reason, some of the trauma centers have begun performing an extended FAST or EFAST for evaluating for a pneumothorax or for hemothorax in addition to those intraperitoneal injuries. So we have to ask the question with any study, it's, it's important to know what is it that you see. It's important to know exactly what the exam is capable of identifying. And so for the FAST exam, we're able to see intraperitoneal free fluid. And we use this three views of a right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and pelvic view to see into Morrison's pouch, the spleno renal right recess, and the pouch of Douglas. Uh, for the trauma patient, free fluid in the abdomen or around the heart is usually blood until proven otherwise, although we all know that that fluid can be something else. Um, when, we, when we look into these areas, the reason why we choose that right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and pelvis is that these are dependent areas and it's where that fluid is going to collect, so we have the best chance at seeing it if we focus on those areas. The 
fluid is usually going to show up as dark or anechoic pockets of fluid. Uh, when we look at the heart, where you typically will use a sub-xiphoid four-chamber view, which we'll take a look at in this talk today, or if we're unable to get an adequate view there, we may move to the parasternal view. And again, what we're really looking for is fluid surrounding the heart that is causing that hemodynamic instability. So just as important as knowing what we can see is knowing what we can't see or what can't be identified, no matter the effort or the skill level of the operator. And this typically includes retroperitoneal hemorrhage, which is important in those pelvic fractures, or small volumes of fluid, typically quoted as less than 200 cc's, although it, it typically will take up to 400 cc's for us to be able to reliably identify it on fast exam. Hollow viscous injury is missed. Solid organ injuries, we may see evidence of them, but may not see the actual injury itself. And then blood that isn't there yet, and this is an important concept in FAST, is that it's a picture in time, um, but can be repeated. And so if we don't have enough fluid yet to be able to see the free fluid on FAST exam, we can repeat it if the person, if the patient again decompensates or, or we're unable to figure out exactly what's going on. So our indications for FAST, um, the typical in indications are a hemodynamically unstable, blunt abdominal trauma patient. Ultrasound is, again, poor at identifying grading solid organ injuries, bowel injuries, or retroperitoneal trauma. However, once FAST is able to detect that there is free intraperitoneal fluid, um, it gives us an idea of either which cavity to enter or if the person is unstable, head directly to the operating room or if they're stable to pursue additional imaging or the presence of cardiac tamponade. You know, dy dynamic instability and free intraperitoneal fluid mandates laparotomy um, with, with the idea that the person does have an intraabdominal hemorrhage. Next is penetrating injury to the thorax. FAST can detect a pericardial collection causing cardiac tamponade. Um, again, may give us an idea of what's causing that hemodynamic instability and a penetrating injury to the thorax. And then the caveat to this is in a hemodynamically stable blunt abdominal trauma patient with inadequate or compromised physical exam that, again, FAST can be used for, give us quick information to decide what our next step would be in somebody who we're not able to get an adequate physical exam on. So let's get down to how we do this. Um, I think one of the things that comes up, especially with our learners, is how do you even set up the ultra ultrasound machines? And instead of focusing on any one machine, we'll just focus on the general concepts here. And the first is, is to set up your supplies. We'll use the mnemonic scanning um, to give us more information and to basically give us a, a set way to set up our, our ultrasound machine each time we do it. So start with gathering supplies. All equipment necessary for ultrasound scanning should be prepared, and this includes not only the ultrasound machine, plugging it into power, making sure the gel is available, and that we're ready to go. The next is comfortable positioning, and the patient should be positioned in a way that the patient is comfortable, but so is the surgeon and the ultrasound machine are all arranged in a way that are ergonomic and allow for a time-efficient performance. Um, usually the ultrasound machine is set up with the screen at the operator's eye level, um, but also sometimes across the bed that's not always feasible in the trauma bay. Next would be your ambience or your room setting. Adjust the lights in the room in order to view the ultrasound machine adequately. And then name and procedure, and this is a little different per each hospital. We discussed this in the last webinar, that um, make sure that your patient's information is entered. Some ultrasound machines will dump those images directly into packs. Others will save them and require that the, the images be moved over. But this is important for both documentation and billing and for our quality improvement practices so that we can go back once we do have more information about the patient and see that our FAST was correct. And then nominate transducer, essentially select your transducer, and we'll talk some about this today, about choosing a transducer that best fits your procedure to be done. In general, for the FAST exam, the convex or curved probe is mainly used. However, the phased array probe may give additional cardiac views, especially if you're struggling with that cardiac view. Next is infection control. Make sure your probes are clean. Um, and usually that's best done at the, the end of the, the FAST exam that was done prior, so to leave the machine clean when you're done. N is for no lateral and medial side on your screen. So orient your transducer and apply the gel to match the required probe position. So note the marker dot position both on the 
probe and then on the screen, sometimes it helps to touch one edge of the transducer so that you orient yourself to what is medial or lateral or what is right or left and make sure that, that corresponds to what you're seeing on the screen. Make sure you have a sufficient amount of gel to both the transducer and to the patient's skin to allow for transmission of the ultrasound. Um, insufficient quality of gel will decrease this reflection and absorption rates and you're going to end up with a blurry picture that isn't giving you the information that you had hoped for. And then last but not least is your gain, depth, and focus point. So start by placing the transducer on the patient's skin and then adjust these machine settings. The majority of the newer machines have these preset, so if you tell the machine that you're looking at an abdomen, it will preset that um, to both that um, average depth and um, the uh, gain. Your focus point should be in the center of your screen, but again, given your patient's um, habitus or, or what you're actually looking at, some of this may need to be moved. And then also know that if you need to switch your mode, so for example, sometimes color Doppler can help better see blood pressures or M mode may look better for a pneumothorax, so be aware that those settings exist. So let's move on to probes. Um, these are the two probes that are most commonly used in the FAST and EFAST. Uh, the first is the phased array ultrasound probe. Um, it is there on your left. Um, usually its, it's beam shape is triangular and is good for a cardiac exam. On the right is the curvilinear probe, and its beam shape is mo more convex and good for more of a depth exam, and so we'll typically use that for the abdominal portion of the FAST exam. As we approach the cardiac e exam, you'll see that the curvilinear probe can just be moved up and used for the cardiac exam, although it doesn't give as specific of a picture as the phased array. So let's jump into this. Um, the right upper quadrant view. This is a good place to start because if there is going to be fluid, it's usually here. So with the right upper quadrant view, we usually take a longitudinal view with the probe indicator towards the patient's head. Um, again, this is going to look at Morrison's pouch and start by placing the probe in the anterior axillary line between the lower ribs. And again, this is what we're looking for. Um, and more of a picture depiction. Aim to identify the interface between the kidney and liver with the diaphragm in view. And this is the area w that we're looking at. So I do ask particularly that, um, that the, the learners find the tip of the right lobe of the liver as this is our most inferior portion and this is where the fluid is most likely to collect. Occasionally you need to move up or down a rib space or two to be able to get your best view. And again, the right upper quadrant view is the most likely to be positive in a patient with free fluid in the abdomen, which is why when we do have concern for blood abdominal injuries, injury that we often will start here. So let's look at what this looks like in the normal patient. Um, here's a normal right upper quadrant view. You can see the liver, the diaphragm, the kidney, but no black fluid at any of those interfaces. And this is different when we see this in a positive view. So here's one in the longitudinal and transverse views. And again, you can see the liver, but now there's now a dark fluid between it and the diaphragm, which is going to implicate that there is some free fluid. The left upper quadrant view, um, orient the probe for a longitudinal view. Start with placing the probe on the posterior axillary line between the 10th and 11th ribs. This is more posterior or more cephalad than the right upper quadrant view. Aim to identify the interface between the spleen and the kidney and make sure that you also have the diaphragm in view. And again, this gives you an idea of what that looks like. Um, you Again, you have the spleen and the kidney in the same view. When you do see that, you know that you are posterior enough and will pick up the area that is most likely to contain that fluid. The back of your hand is typically directly on the bed, which does make this a little bit more difficult. It may be underneath the pa patients in order to get that optimal view. If the person's awake and they can follow your commands, it may help to ask the patient to take a deep breath, which will bring those necessary, push down the diaphragm, bring those necessary structures into view. The left upper quadrant most commonly by our learners is noted to be the most difficult view to obtain. And so let's look at what some of these look like. This is a normal image. You see the spleen, the diaphragm. Um, we are more posterior. We're seeing that pleural space, and you see the splenal renal interface. Here is a positive view. Um, so again, we see that free, free fluid sitting above the spleen. It's gonna, again going to show up as black fluid. 
next is our pelvic view. This is the most dependent portion of the peritoneal space and is also likely to see an area where we're going to see free fluid. Start with the longitudinal view, and I know this varies some by the person doing the scan. Um, I think that it's easiest to see the anatomy in the longitudinal view, whereas when we turn the probe, sometimes it's difficult to, to keep your area to know exactly where you're at. Um, the probe is placed in the midline cephalad to the pubic bone with the marker pointed towards the head. Ideally, this exam is performed prior to placing your Foley catheter um, in a patient with a full bladder, only because with the full bladder, we're better able to distinguish the structures. And so again, this is the area that we're looking for. Um, the bladder will be, if it is full, will be relatively dark um, with the urine in the bladder. The pockets of fluid can be identified around posterior and lateral to the bladder. And again, remember that when a person does have significant hemorrhage from pelvic fractures, that this is likely to be in the retroperitoneal space and may destroy, or destroy, excuse me, to distort um, the anatomy in this area as it pushes the bladder either forward or, or to one side. Um, and also given the fact that this fluid is retroperitoneal, it may not show up on your FAST exam. So again, here's a normal view. The uh, urine in the bladder is black, but we don't see any of that additional black fluid on either side of the bladder. And then here we do see the free fluid um, black, similar to the urine that is in the bladder. So let's move on to the cardiac views. The first we're going to go over is the subdiphoid sub four-chamber view. This uh, view will identify fluid around the heart. The probe is usually placed in the transverse orientation and placed immediately below the xiphoid. Important to hold your hand on top of the probe because if not, you're not able to get enough depth to the probe to get underneath that xiphoid. Aim the probe towards the patient's left shoulder while applying pressure to the probe towards the patient's abdomen. And again, this is the view that we're looking for. This maneuver permits the scanning the surface of the probe to make full contact with the skin while still aiming towards the heart. And be sure to scan through the whole heart, particularly the posterior pericardium where the blood is going to pull first in our supine patient. So we're going to go ahead and show a video of this, give you an idea of what this looks like. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at what's called a sub-xiphoid view. <clears throat> so we're going to get our label. We're going to look at sub -xiphoid. You can You can abbreviate it different ways. I'll use SX. You can spell it out. Um, it's okay. It's just as long as it's clear what you're looking at. Um, <clears throat> so you have a choice of two probes you can use. We talked about the cardiac probe we used in the past. You can still you can use this. However, in a trauma setting, sometimes it's not convenient to start swapping through probes. So you can also use the abdominal probe to look for fluid in that area there. You just have to realize that there are some convention there are some convention issues related to how cardiology and echo is done versus how uh, the, the precepts for the abdominal probe is. <clears throat> You'll notice that your marker over here is on your right, on the patient's right or the left side of the screen. That correlates to the marker on your probe right here. So for the cardiac exam, what we're going to do is we're going to keep it looking on the, to the patient's right, just like that. <clears throat> take your position right now. We're we'll gonna take take it. Look, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep it to the to the patient's right, and we're gonna look just the sub xiphoid area. You're gonna want to hold the probe from the top. You hold it from underneath here or any other way like this. Sometimes what you'll do is you'll block your belly to flatten out. So what I what you need to do is you need to kind of come down and what you do is flatten out your probe. You're trying to image the heart in sort of a, you know, in the, in from, from below in a flat plane, and depending on how you're oriented will depend on what the heart looks like. You're going to want to use the left lobe, I'm going to change my screen again. Okay. So for this view, a couple of things you're going to want to note is that you're going, this is a deeper view, so you're going to want to increase your depth. Okay, you're going to want to increase your depth. So the target organ is right here. That's a good depth for this. You're going to use the left lobe of the liver. 
to, to is a is a window to see the heart easier. So it, because some stomach contents will be over here on the right side of the screen, and it may shadow out your ability to see the entire the pericardial area. And this view here. The dependent portion of your heart is right over, is between the interface of the liver and the heart. This is where fluid will accumulate if it's going to accumulate first. And it will be jet black, just like blood is to you in a ventricles, it'll look, it'll look black. That's the, this view is utilized primarily to assess for, for effusion in a trauma setting. And any evidence of tamponade, you can see by looking at your right ventricle, your left ventricle, Right atrium, left atrium. So this would be collapsing if that was if there was if there was fluid in there and not, and not allowing it to fill. This is your sub right leg. This is sub right leg view. Shoulder view. Yeah. So it's just important to make sure that when you when you're use that you use the liver as you can to try and avoid stomach issues, that you flatten out your probe in the sub right area. And then you just sort of, then you kind of, ro small rotations and movements will help allow you to see the, all the, all the various chambers. Looking at here, we're gonna take this and we're gonna actually, with the curvy linear probe we just used, it was to his right. Now we're gonna go put it to his left. And we're gonna increase our depth a little bit because it's gonna be, it's gonna be kind of deep enough here. And we're gonna bring up a little bit of gain So again, you can see the same views. You see your right but your left ventricle, your atrium sitting there. You see your lower your liver there. Important to notice the same view as before. The apex is still on the right side of the screen there. That's that standard cardiac or echo orientation. Just note that I'm doing that because now the probe marker is, for, is to the patient's left instead of the patient's right, which is the way we use for the curvy linear probe. So. And that's the only nuance when you're looking at with cardiac probe compared to the um, curvilinear probe or balance probe as far as uh, probe orientation. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful. And again, you saw both um, using the, the curvilinear probe and the phased array. Um, sometimes it is easier to go ahead and use the curvy linear probe because it's what's in your hand after the abdominal fast portion, um, but the better views can be obtained um, with the phased array. So let's go ahead and look again at some normal views. Here's a normal sub xiphoid four chamber view um, where you're able to see all four of the chambers. The apex is to the right of the screen. And here's an abnormal view. And again, we're able to see that pericardial effusion blood inside of the heart is going to be black, um, similar to the fluid that is outside of the heart as the pericardial effusion. So in the extended fast, uh, we're going to go ahead and include some lung views, and we're looking for pneumothorax, hemothorax. Um, these are set up using um, the phased array, linear or curvy linear probe, um, with some of these because, again, the curvy linear probe is used to looking at deeper structures in particularly the abdomen, you may need to say, change some of your pre-settings um, to be able to see correctly. So the curvy linear probe can be used if you just completed the abdominal exam, but your linear probe is going to give you your best view. Usually start with a longitudinal view at the second intercostal space midclavicular line. Air will collect anteriorly in our supine patient, so this probe position is usually best um, to be able to view the anterior chest. The probe um, is, is placed in that longitudinal view, and then we're going to look for lung sliding, which is movement between the visceral and parietal pleuras. And this is what that looks like. So here you're able to see the two ribs, which are labeled, and then the pleural line is the focus of the EFAS examination for pneumothorax. And what we're looking for along that pleural line is lung, lung sliding. And essentially what lung sliding is is we will see um, essentially the, the rubbing of the parietal and visceral pleura that will look like um, either some people call it a blinking line or ants walking on a line. You can also look for a comet tail artifact and this essentially 
Um, it looks like search lights extending from the plural line perpendicular to the plural line. These are also known as B lines, and these are reverberation artifacts that appear as these hypoechoic vertical lines that extend from the plural to the edge of the screen without fading. Um, these are going to move synchronously with long sliding respiratory movement. So when they are present, this implies that there is long sliding and rules out a, normal, a pneumothorax. We also can switch over to the M mode when assessing for pneumothorax. The M mode is going to detect motion over time and will evaluate the pattern below the pleural line. This is beneficial mostly in patients where sliding may be very subtle, such as the elderly or in a patient with a poor pulmonary reserve who's not taking very large breaths. So a seashore line is considered normal, and this is at the pleural and lung interface, you see a wavy pattern generated by that sliding motion. And because, again, this is what we would consider normal and it is implying that there is motion, this would be negative for no pneumothorax. The stratosphere um, is abnormal, and this is where the pleural and lung are indistinguishable as linear hypoechogenic lines. This is a motionless pattern because there is not lung sliding and is reliable for the diagnosis of pneumothorax. So again, we'll watch a video of how this is done. Makes the EFAST exam. What it typically involves is lung, lung images. The first thing to do is to figure out what probe you're going to use for lung images. If you look, there are two probes, you can use any one of three probes. I'll tell you the advantages quickly of each one. You can use the phase array probe we just used for the cardiac imaging. That would be, that, that usually has some lung settings built into it. That is one option to use for uh, the lung finding. The Advantages, it's already in your hand if you're using it for the heart. It has presets already made for it, and it has nice depths. So you'll be able to get all the way down to the, to the depth you need to for that exam. You can also use the linear probe, which we haven't, we haven't used yet, but this is the linear probe. The high frequency of the linear probe allows for a good resolution. It's really good for more superficial findings, so if you're looking just at the very lung pleura, you can use this probe as well. The advantages that you'll see nice detail. This advantage is, is that you won't, it, it, depending on the, on the width of the probe, it gives you a finite width of rib space you can, you can look at, um, as well as, as it, the further deep, deeper you go, the, the worse seeing the images or the diff more difficulty it is to, to obtain the views you need. The other probe you can use, which is the one that I typically will use, is, a, is the abdominal probe. And some of these probes will come and you can have them set up for three sets on them. If not, you can configure your abdominal mode settings for the presets you want. But I use this probe mainly because I have it in my hand typically already, so it's already in my hand for when I just did my FAST exam. It's utilized, it's best utilized for those uh, posterior pleural views we're gonna show in a second. And it also um, can be used because it can allows you to get the depth of the chest that you want. So I find it to be a pretty good overall useful probe for this. Just have to know some of the, some of the and the other, some of the ways to kind of reconfigure it. So we talked about before about the image uh, modality you're looking at. The reason that these are important is because these are preset image modalities that are based on what the best way to see that, that tissue that you're looking at is. So for cardiac, if the cardiac probe is set up, it's, it's set up that way. For abdomen, for example, it's set up for abdominal imaging. So it's looking to say, okay, if I'm looking in the abdomen, how, what are the, what's the best way that the mathematical calculations are set up so the probe can see that? That's the idea behind these presets. For the lung, what I typically use is I use the abdominal setting, and then if I need to, I will change some of the settings in the machine to, uh, to amplify if I'm looking for fluid or not. I will tell you that the, um, the most the best way to do this is to have someone set your machine up ahead of time so that you have those presets or th that sort of adjustments made so you're not doing it new each time or on the fly. First thing we're going to do is we're going to look at for a, a pneumothorax, typically in a trauma patient. They're going to sit; it's going to sit. And the LA air will come up. You're going to see it anteriorly. Typically, what we're going to look at is we're going to try and look at the, between the, the, the third and fourth interspace because that's where lung the air actually accumulates first. If you ideally, what you're going to look at is you're going to look at the highest portion of, the, of their chest because that's where air really accumulates. So we typically say the third or fourth interspace. What this is. Sometimes it may be a little bit further down, sometimes it may be a little bit further up, but that's a generally a good space to start to look at. So I usually look at mid trabecular line, look at the right anterior lung. And so since I'm looking for a pneumothorax, I'm gonna look for what we call lung sliding. 
Because we're looking for lump sliding, I don't need all this space back here to look at this. So that we're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop my depth down and take a look at this a little more closely. Here you have two ribs, so you want to put, angle the probe perpendicular to the ribs as they traverse the chest. So this rather than that, that the the marker is not necessarily up toward the head specifically. It's usually as the, as the ribs come across this way, it'll be perpendicular to those ribs as they come across up there. And so I notice that they're just perpendicular because I see black shadows behind it indicating my rib space. And what I'm looking for here is there's a lot of, there's a couple different acronyms, but what he basically is looking for is the visceral or the quieter pleural moving as there is the person or patient breathes. And here you can see that motion. And that's the motion you're looking for. Sometimes people say this is like little ants dancing. You can kind of see that over here. I just look for movement at the junction of the visceral and pleural pleural, which is this bright line right here. Okay, so we also can assess for hemothorax or pleural fusion, and again, this is the same probe in positions as the um, FAST exam because we are going to look at that that low angle um, near the diaphragm. We're looking for fluid above the diaphragm, and again, the amount of fluid required to see on imaging, as you can see, an ultrasound is only 20 cc's, significantly less than your upright or supine chest x-ray, so this really is a great way to be able to see fluid, um, especially in our trauma patients. So we'll watch how this is done. The other, for the EFAST, the other portion that we're going to do is the, so we talked about anterior, look for pneumothorax primarily. The, we're going to do a, a posterior lateral, uh, a posterior axillary line view that looks at the diaphragm um, relative to the spine to look for pleural waste fluid. So it looks very similar to your trauma views, you already did before. So a lot of times what I will typically do is when I'm doing my right upper quadrant view, I will slide the, the probe just a little bit toward the head because this, this looking at the trauma view, I'm usually up here. All I do is I slide a little bit toward the head, come back a little posteriorly here. And what I'm looking for is this diaphragm, and I'm looking for this spine. You can see there's a cubal body is right here. Okay, this, right, this is the diaphragm. Notice as he breathes, part of his spine goes away. That is normal. That's what you want. If there were, and the reason why is because what's going on is as ultrasound's coming through here, the lung and his air, the air in his lungs is actually dispersing the beam and not allowing that transmission to me to see the spine. Much like the liver and kidney are in great transducer or kind of ultrasound friendly, so I can see stuff behind there. On this one, I can't when that lung gets in the view. So if I can, if this, when he breathes in, if I still saw spine this way over here, that would indicate to me that he has fluid in that pleural space. And that's what we call a spine sign, like a positive spine sign. So last, we just want to revisit this idea of the cardiac probes, because as I mentioned, as you saw in the earlier video, the same curvilinear probe can be used for the cardiac exam that we use the abdominal exam. But in general, the face array probe is better for the cardiac exam. So I want to go ahead and again take a look at what that looks like. This is the subzyphoid view with the curvilinear the abdominal probe. So I just want to point out that you can use the cardiac probe for that. It's one of the standard views for that this probe. But I want to point out some orientation issues that are different than when you're using the curvilinear probe. The first thing you're going to do is you need to select the right probe. So we're going to go back to our transducer screen on whatever machine we're using. We're going to go to the, card, the probe that correlates there, the cardiac probe. Um, most probes have a label on all of them. In fact, they all do. They'll tell you what probe they are and also what, what frequency range they go in. And you can actually pick your, they will have them labeled typically in the screen that you're looking at, on the, especially in the newer machines. So I pick the probe that matches. And then I also know that I'm on the right probe by looking at my, my desktop here, my ultrasound desktop, what I call it. It's, the, it's this probe here, which is labeled as here, and it's, the, and it's the five to one megahertz probe. That's correct. And now I'm also on my cardiac settings. So I know what probe I have. Important when you do cardiac settings is that you notice that there, your marker over here flips. So your marker now is on the right side of the screen, whereas before it was on the left side of the screen. This only happens in cardiac mode settings. It's, it's the only mode that we typically use in, from point of care ultrasound that does this. Um, it, it, the important thing is, is that you just need to kind of remember the orientation of this, of your probe marker probe, and how it's in the orientation that it is in the body, so that you have similar images, no matter if you're doing it, using it curvilinear probe for the cardiac setting, or 
the phased array or the cardiac probe for the subxiphoid images. So, so with that understanding, um, if we're unable to get a great view with the subxiphoid four chamber um, view, we can go ahead and, and use our phased array probe to get a pair of sternal long axis view. So the phased array probe is placed to the left of the sternum. And as mentioned, the probe marker oriented to the right shoulder. Move the probe towards the feet until you're able to see the full view. Um, and this is what we're looking for. Should be able to bring the descending thoracic aorta into view to distinguish pericardial versus para, para uh, excuse me, pleural fluid. And again, we'll give you an idea of what that looks like. The other view that we're going to look at is a, is a parasternal long axis view, which is the other view you can get. If you have a hard time using the, if you can't get a subxiphoid view, which is not uncommon during trauma patients because either they have a lot of gas in their stomach and they're over, sh over um, they're blocking your window for your liver to use, then sometimes you can use the parasternal long axis view of the heart, which is uh, on the chest itself. Everybody's a little bit different, so what I typically will do is I'll take the probe, I will start high, I will orient it toward his, the marker toward his right shoulder, and we're going to drag it down parasternally on the screen until I see exactly what I want on the screen, which I see right here. The distance between the probe and the heart is a lot shorter in this view, so we know that, so we're going to change the depth to make this a lot easier to read. So, in this view here, we have the probe marker oriented to his, pa the patient's right shoulder. This is in cardiac mode. And on the screen, you're going to see the right ventricle, the left ventricle, the mitral valve. You're going to see the aortic root right here, the left atrium, and the descending thoracic aorta. It's important that you're down, in, that you're able to see descending thoracic aorta because that will, that is where your that demarcates whether or not you have pleural based fluid or pericardial based fluid or mediastinal based because the <clears throat> heart is a mediastinal structure, so is the aorta. Fluid that comes in here will go past the, will go past the aorta if it's pericardial in origin. If it's pleural based in origin, it will stop and never go it will never make it past the aorta. So when you're in a trauma scenario if you're trying to figure out if it's pleural or if it's blood in the pericardium, the, the descending thoracic aorta is your marker to use to delineate, to help delineate that. Fluid in the, the parasternal long axis will accumulate here because this is the posterior portion of the patient. This is anterior. This is to the right, kind of right right shoulder side. And this area going on the left side of the screen represents more of it is angling toward the patient's left hip. So that's the plane that you're looking at is. Again, descending thoracic aorta right here. Last but not least, I just want to give a plug for the EAST guidelines. There is an EAST guideline for blunt abdominal trauma and for blunt cardiac injury, both of which will give us some guidance on using FAST and EFAST. Thank you very much. Okay, Charity, thanks a lot. That was uh, helpful to see the actual, you know, how you actually use the probes, and many thanks to your uh, colleague who is a, is a nice model for that too. So um, let's turn it over now to uh, Dr. Benji Christie. Benji, go ahead and take it away. All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, I appreciate the East opportunity for uh, this uh, educational experience, and thank you for including me. And Dave, I appreciate all the hard work you did with this, uh, you know, organizing this and, and putting these, helping make these, uh, th th these visuals happen. It's pretty incredible. Um, I've got a reasonable amount to get through, and uh, I've been known to do a little more storytelling than sticking to the script, so um, I put an outline together just to uh, just to provide a brief overview of uh, where we want to go. I've, uh, I've got a few slides just to discuss uh, kind of what HTE is and uh, where it's come from, and within our um, practice sphere, you know how we use it. And I've selected uh, four cases that I consider pretty routine for us, and I'm sure they're routine for you as well. Um, I've got a brief uh, sort of section on methods of interpretation and then future directions, and then I'm hoping to hustle so we can have some good question discussion time. 
Um, hemodynamic management and fluid balances in the resuscitation case is a constant challenge. It's never been uh, easy. The, the holy grail for endpoints of resuscitation continues to elude you know, uh, uh, medical and surgical researchers, and we're very well aware that under-resuscitation has deleterious effects as it relates to survival statistics, and over-resuscitation has its unwanted outcomes in terms of morbidity and mortality statistics of its own. So. Finding that sweet spot in resuscitation is really our goal and challenge uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, transesophageal echocardiography has been around for many, many decades. It's been in the hands of cardiologists and uh, maybe some cardiac anesthesiologists primarily, um, and it's excellent. Uh, it's uh, been increasingly utilized in the field of critical care over the last decade and a half at this point. Um, it's accurate. It's reproducible. Uh, it's a fine assessment tool for cardiac anatomy and functional performance, but, you know, large multi-plane TEs get several drawbacks. You know, it requires a full-scale monitor and module. Uh, the, bul the probes are bulky, bigger, and less flexible than the endoscopes, and they require the probe to be inserted and reinserted for each and every exam. And it's, this, these things potentially limit the clinician's ability to accurately follow changes over time uh, and makes it a little impractical in the ICU. Um, but with the newly developed um, HTE probes and monitors, uh, this is changing. So uh, you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, there's a, an older gentleman who's one of my mentors. His name is John Hudson. He's a cardiologist and intensivist, and he sort of uh, was my, my mentor for echocardiography. And he's standing with a relatively contemporary multi-plane uh, TEE monitor and probe. And then the, the other picture is representative of what the full-scale uh, HTE probe looks like, uh, and behind uh, me is that uh, our, our monitor as well. So, um, with the advent of HTE, there are several advantages that uh, multiplane and full scale TE didn't allow. It allows for you know continuous anatomical assessment of the heart and great vessels. This is, this device and this technology allows for cardiac evaluations to be performed real time in the critically ill or injured patients. And it also because it's, it can be left indwelling for up to 72 hours, it allows you the opportunity to continuously reassess how your patient's performing after each and every therapeutic maneuver you may pre perform. So um, if you haven't seen the probe, this is uh, another full-scale image. Uh, the probe is about 17 French in diameter. It's about the size of a good NG tube. It's semi-flexible at the tip. It has a handle or a wand that allows for anaflexion and retroflexion and then torque being provided by the, uh, the operator to allow for satisfactory image capture. Uh, during the exam, um, the idea is that because your access to cardiac performance is continuously avail available from a visualization perspective, you can assess your hypotensive patient, your hemorrhagic shot patients, you can obtain your three views, you can decide you know, where their uh, needs may be, and then make a therapeutic maneuver, whether it be add volume, whether it be add pressors, change pressors, de-escalate therapy, with the ultimate goals of improving end organ perfusion and uh, preventing organ failure and, and survival, improving outcomes. The three examination views obtained by HTE are the transgastric view, which is a short axis view that allows for visualization of both cardiac ventricles and it permits measuring of the uh, left ventricular size, calculation of the left ventricular fractional area contraction, and you know, examination septal size, shape, and, and wall motion abnormalities that may or may not exist. The four-chamber view is a metasophageal view, and it's a long-axis view that provides visualization of the four cardiac chambers and gives you the opportunity to measure or to estimate left ventricular and right ventricular in diastolic and in systolic size, calculate a LV ejection fra fraction. And then the superior vena cava view is a long-axis view. It's at the level of the SVC in the right atrium, and at this uh, examination point, uh, the SVC's diameter during the respiratory cycle and its variation can be assessed and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and determined. And I've got real-time videos of these uh, coming up. So I told myself I wasn't going to um, turn this into, uh, you know, cite everything in the literature that has to do with HTE, but I did want to bring up, and I have some at the end as well, you know, relatively recent paper in the Intensive Care Medicine Journal, which uh, at a 94, you know, they, the probe was inserted in 94 patients and was left in the dwelling for 72 hours. Multiple examinations were performed, and the hemodynamic assessment with the HTE allowed for uh, a direct therapeutic impact of 66% of the patients they studied. And this is what we found in our practice as well. It's, uh, it's, uh, the probe is incredibly impactful, uh, and despite what clinical markers we may and, 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 uh, and 
and uh, assumptions we may have coming into a clinical case. The probe has often been uh, uh, an, a, a tool that has uh, sort of spotlighted um, the, uh, the patient's real needs that we may have underestimated or even overestimated. But one of the first cases to, I wanted to get to is um, a, uh, a, a, it's a trauma case that would uh, eventually develop an ARDS picture. This was a gunshot wound to the chest. This patient was shot in the right chest. He came in with a uh, large right-sided hemothorax. Um, the chest tube was placed, and he had a tremendous amount of blood loss uh, from his chest tube. MTP was activated, and he went to the operating room. He wound up getting about four, if I'm not mistaken, four rounds of MTP, and the blood loss overall was on the order of biblical. But uh, he recovered and went to the ICU, and um, Wound up developing a trolley that progressed into an APRV, I mean, to an ARDS type picture. He was requiring APRV to oxygenate, and he fluffed out his uh, non contused, non hemorrhaged lung to a point where, you know, too little fluid, I mean, too much fluid would potentially put us in an uh, uncomfortable respiratory position, even more so. But his pressure was somewhat soft, and his heart rate had been in the low teens, so we really weren't sure what we would. Uh, what to expect. So I uh, have a video here. So we put a probe down, and initially the team was thinking he may be dry and we want to protect that lung. So when we put the probe down, you can see his left ventricle uh, in the transgastric view is hyperdynamic and beaten wall to wall and feeling very poorly. And his superior vena cava is rest very significantly with respirations. Uh oh. Go back. Move right through on this. Um, Start that again, just so you can see it better. And so the superior vena cava view in, in the uh, middle of the screen, you can see it uh, varies significantly with respirations. And then this four chamber view, you can see the trabeculations of the back wall and the right ventricle swinging in as it's very uh, under underfilled. So instead of diuretics, we actually gave this patient more blood. And uh, this was after one unit had been infused and another was on the way. You can see his vena cave is a lot more plump, the first uh, image on your uh, left-hand side. Uh, his four-chamber view demonstrates better filling and a more robust right ventricle. And then his uh, um, left ventricle actually has a more smooth and even uh, wall motion and fills much more appropriately. So uh, while a young man who had had uh, multiple rounds of MTP uh, one would think, at least I would have estimated, he was volume overloaded. He was, in fact, not, and the probe helped helped us understand his physiologic needs a little bit better. Um, the next case, uh, also a little bit of a surprise. Uh, this uh, is where I feel like HTE really made a big difference in guiding a resuscitation strategy in a pretty complicated everyday patient. This patient, one of my partners, did a uh, uh, uneventful, very successful laparoscopic appendectomy on a 72-year-old male. Um, the patient went to the recovery room, but in the recovery room they had uh, some monitor changes, implying ST segment elevations. They got a 12-lead EKG in the recovery room, and he was, they were real. Uh, but he was hemodynamically stable, he was asymptomatic, and they chose to monitor him in one of our cardiac observation step-down floors. But on post-op, uh, number two, his enzymes had risen a little bit, his troponin had bumped. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, astronomical, but it definitely was a noteworthy lab. He developed respiratory distress, got short of breath, uh, had an oliguric trend in his urine output. Um, his creatinine was rising, and they intubated him on the floor and sent him to the ICU. Uh, hearing the story and uh, checking the plain film, you know, the initial assessment on our end was he's probably volume overloaded, and we need to be, you know, prepared to uh, maybe be a little restrictive with the fluid imbalance and also maybe even diuresin. But we uh, used HTE to help us understand him. In fact, it was the opposite. He was uh, volume depleted. His uh, left ventricle filled very poorly with hyperdynamic wall motion. His superior vena cava was very, very collapsible. And uh, his uh, right ventricle and four chamber view also was uh, uh, um, very volume depleted. Um, so he actually got aggressively resuscitated, and, and uh, we rechecked at four hours, uh, and he had smoother uh, left ventricular wall motion. He had uh, better filling. He had a more plump and robust uh, vena cava, and uh, his uh, RV uh, filled better, and he had much more even cardiac wall motion after uh, resuscitation. This was just for four hours. He went on to do fine. He began making adequate urine per hour, never had any further rise in his cardiac enzymes. And I really feel that uh, you know, being able to see uh, him respond and understand what he needed with uh, direct visualization was one of the reasons. 
This is a, a routine trauma case, case number three. Um, and uh, those that are uh, paying careful attention in the audience could probably qualify this as an M&M, and I've already taken this beating. But uh, is, this was a 58-year-old male who um, came in as a two-car, head on MVC. He was awake, alert, and oriented. He was tachycardic in the 120s. He had pain, he had sore cyst for pain. Uh, but otherwise, his vital signs were stable. He was sat and fine. He had left hip pain and an obvious right you know, ankle deformity. So he had uh, got some CT scans after his primary and secondary survey, and you know, he had a very small spleen lack. He had a you know, relatively complex left tab fracture, but did, you know, had a small pelvic hematoma. And then a uh, left hip fib fracture with uh, distraction at the level of the right ankle. Um, for whatever reason, the orthopedist and the uh, and the uh, operating room were just ready to go. Um, he'd gotten a, a two liters of crystalloid in the uh, trauma bay and was getting some more. Um, they had, uh, in a relatively expeditious fashion, just wanted to take this patient on up, and we, you know, uh, allowed it. He got a ORF of his tib fib and stabilization of his tab, but intraoperatively his heart rate had stayed in the 120s, and his blood pressure seemed to sag in the mid 90s. And they checked the intraoperative lactate. And it was 3.5 hemoglobin was stable intraoperatively from you know admission values, but they anesthesia reported giving him two units of blood, five liters of crystalloid, two amps of bicarb, and amphocalcium gluconate. And the orthopedist only reported 125 cc's of blood loss with all that. But he came to the ICU and and he was unstable. Um, he had what I would feel a relatively reasonable volume of resuscitation in the operating room, but he remained tachycardic and and uh, hypotensive. So uh, we placed a probe to better understand him, and um, he was uh, very volume depleted. Uh, you can see his vena cava is almost ribbon-like, and uh, his left ventricle uh, functions very poorly and feels very poorly. Um, we began resuscitating him with uh, uh, more crystalloid, and um, this is uh, just a demonstration of the uh, vena cava, the superior vena cava, as a uh, pre-bolus and, and post-bolus. Uh, this is around the four-hour mark. He had a uh, very ribbon-like vena cava at the baseline, and then after fluid resuscitation, he responded very nicely. And uh, you can see his vena cava is a lot more plump. And the same sort of comparison view with the uh, transgastric view. The left ventricle feels poorly and functions poorly on the, uh, the pre-bolus uh, image, and then post-bolus, it's a little more smooth and has a little bit better feeling volumes. So. Uh, and this is a uh, the four chamber view. Uh, you know, basically had an obliterated right ventricle with no volume, and then much more uh, uh, still unresuscitated, but had a better right ventricle after uh, his uh, therapeutic interventions with uh, crystalloid infusion. So, uh, the final case to uh, kind of run through is uh, this was a MDC. It was really he was ejected from the back of the truck, and he had multiple injuries, and, uh, including a multi eleven C spine fracture that gave him a component of spinal shock. Um, he had uh, resuscitated in the trauma bay. He had an operation the night of his arrival, and uh, was in that kind of complex uh, uh, position where he's had a tremendous amount of volume, yet he's got a component of spinal shock. Uh, when we were rounding on him, he'd somehow found a way to have pressors titrated all the way up to the 20s. Um, so we checked with our probe. We'd been following him, and we started recording kind of where he was. And on the left is transgastric view. This is him on 22 levofed. And he uh, looks like he's got a little hyperdynamic wall motion and needs volume. The vena cava supports this. It's very collapsible and implies he would respond to volume. We gave him volume, and uh, we weaned his pressors. Uh, he's a little more uvolemic now at uh, about 3.5 hours. And uh, his level fed is down to 12. His SVC is less collapsible. It's got a little more structure to it. 16 hours later, uh, we're still weaning pressors. In fact, they're off. Uh, he's got very smooth uh, uh, left ventricular wall function. He feels very well, and his vena cava is uh, very satisfactory in size uh, and uh, implies it it's, uh, would not necessarily be responsive to volume therapy. The uh, left ventricle um, at 24 hours looks normal. The metasophageal view at 24 hours, uh, his left and right ventricle both look normal. So. <clears throat>
So if, if you, once you get the images, you know, you practice getting the images. So what do you what, what do you make of them? That's a question I've heard before, and uh, I just showed you the pictures. But w so there's a lot of ways to calculate and measure um, what uh, what you're seeing and translate that into um, what uh, what what it means as it relates to patient needs. So the superior vena cava, there's uh, an indice where uh, one would uh, expect the patient to be volume responsive or volume unresponsive. Uh, about 36% is the number around which the collapsibility implies volume responsiveness or unresponsiveness. Um, you can calculate fractional area change, left ventricular and right ventricular size ratios, uh, left ventricular end diastolic area, target ranges. Uh, these are all like well supported and um, they're uh, exercised in, in not just the, the HTE world but in the cardiology world as well. Um, there is uh, uh, the visual estimation method. Um, which, you know, with enough practice, and sometimes when we're standing over extremes of performance, just understanding where a patient is and where they're going and what you've changed and how they're performing clinically is, is more than satisfactory. These indices and, and measurements, as you uh, work with the, uh, the probe and the device and practice your measuring and get, or, get, or, gain, or, uh, or gather your measurements, there's software-driven computations provided by the device that, uh, that are embedded in its operating system, and this allows for your exam findings uh, such as ventricular chamber size and diastole or systole to be entered, and then the physiologic data, such as EF or cardiac output, it can be generated, uh, and uh, and this can then be used as you carry your uh, your uh, clinical management further. So, future directions. You know, I, I, what I feel we're, we've been doing with HTE is we've been standing over extremes, and now we're starting to. Uh, tailor our therapy better. We're being a little bit more refined, a little bit more precise and accurate. Um, I think that uh, there's been some excellent work, specifically in the ECMO world and even the cardiac surgery world. And real recently, um, there was a paper that demonstrated, uh, that documented RV dysfunction as a new data point. And I think that RV dysfunction should be a new data point. Um, if you uh, consider what cardiology has been doing in the years past, which is sort of disassociating the two sides of the heart, the left and the right side, as we've understand more and more about pre-existing diastolic dysfunction. You know, how is that going to impact, you know, a resuscitation strategy in a patient with a pre-existing cardiac issue? If the right side is, if the left side is basically the, 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 the you know, the filling and and then secondarily our systemic pressure, the right side is our, is our flow. And Without good function of your right side, you won't have good flow. Without good flow, you won't have good filling. Without good filling, you won't have good blood pressure. So I think as we respect the RV more, um, I think we'll see that become a, a new data point. Um, I think as it relates to uh, management of uh, trauma patients or the acutely ill or injured patients, the, the concept of avoiding uh, hospital-associated events is, uh, is, is is certainly a big deal in, in my facility, and um, you know, using HTE to avoid um, AKI driving to uh, CRT is something that uh, I feel there's a certain there's a real role for, and um, a lot of people are working with uh, uh, HTE and and uh, and uh, how they can better manage fluid to be more renal protective. Um, uh, also, uh, management strategies such as massive transfusion protocol. Like when when have we had enough? Um, there's a small study that was done that uh, did demonstrate um, significant, you know, did demonstrate like the, uh, the massive, transfu massive transfusion protocol responsivity. Uh, and I think HT would be a great tool to work with to uh, uh, use MTP a little bit better from a resource utilization standpoint. Um, then um, organ procurement, another study that was presented at uh, one of the big transplant meetings that um, demonstrated an uptick in the usability, 8% uh, of organs that were managed uh, after the, uh, uh, after, you know, brain death and the, uh, um, the life link had uh, taken over the patient care, there was an uptick in 8% of utility after uh, HT had been used to manage their hemodynamic status. So, um, and a, a final thing would be de-escalation of therapy, you know, with, uh, ICU metrics and outcome measures uh, kind of now benchmarking towards um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the the federal mandates, really, you know, as it relates to length of stay and um, ventilator stay days. Uh, De-escalating therapy, this may very well be a good tool to allow us to, whether it be wean, whether it be wean or fluid restrict, uh, wean the ventilator, understand someone's physiologic reserve as these maneuvers are being done so we can make more 
conscientious and, and uh, accurate decisions. Uh, I, I think de-escalation of therapy is definitely a, a place that uh, HTE is going to help us in the future. Um, educational resources for HTE, obviously the point of care echo, bedside echo, as Charity alluded to, there's, you know, AS, there's the, the college has got courses, the East has got some courses, the side of critical care medicine has got courses, but, um, you know, HT, there's not a lot out there. There's some, the, the, the website, Amacor website, has got some very satisfying, very robust uh, references and uh, and some lectures and some visual aids and, and quizzes. And then, um, you know, if you start using it in, um, within your region, your colleague collaboration is something that we've found. You know, we have people come to our institution and we, you know, at meetings we swap videos and, you know, share media across uh, different, you know, hospitals and uh, answer each other's questions. But hopefully maybe one day we can see an expansion of some of these uh, kind of governing bodies of education uh, to uh, to allow for a little bit more exposure to HTE in uh, the education setting. So um, that's uh, uh, any questions. Uh, I guess we're reaching that point, but uh, but I um, that's all I have right now. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Benji. That was awesome. That was really cool. Um, what we're going to do is we are right at uh, one hour here. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, take the liberty and just say we'll go a, an extra 10 minutes or so over for questions and answers. So if you'd like to ask a question, since we've got so many people on the line, probably the best thing to do is to use the text function in the lower left-hand quarter of your screen. Um, we will see it, and if we can get to it, we will uh, read it on the air and then and then have the uh, have the uh, guest respond. Uh, I know Matt Martin uh, wanted to ask a question first, so we'll turn things over to Matt. Yeah, hey, uh, Benji and Charity, that's fantastic talks. And uh, and question for you, Benji. We actually, when I did my fellowship, we did a month of TE, and I forgot how great those images are you can get of <laughs> looking at the heart and the cardiac function. Most of your cases, it seemed like it was helping you out with volume status. Uh, and have you found it to be helpful for other things, like you're having a question of a PE, and it and, you know gives you your diagnosis of PE, or you have the patient who's, you know, decompensating from a myocardial infarction and their cardiac output is rapidly changing. Has, have you found it to be helpful in those scenarios also? Yeah, we've had some of those. Uh, we've had a couple of PE finds, you know, where uh, uh, right side is profoundly dilated, whereas, you know, a day and a half or two days or earlier in their care, maybe it wasn't. Uh, and then eventually the PE was diagnosed. And we've had a couple of cardiac decompensation cases where you can – um, see like a change in uh, wall motion, you know, from something that's maybe more more smooth and even to you know more more hypokinesis or akinesis, um, and uh, and those are, those images are you know definitely um, noticeable um, and uh, fun to compare. But uh, but uh, yeah, we, we we catch those from time to time. So, Bed, I have a quick question for you. How long, when you uh, have a patient you want to put the probe in, how long from sort of decision to acquiring images do you think it, it takes? I mean, does it take a long time to boot up and place the probe, or what, what's that time frame look like? Oh, it's quick. Um, you know, you turn the machine on, and once it's ready, uh, you just, you know, have a probe. Uh, uh, usually we just have to walk down to Central Supply and bring it right back. Um, once you put the probe down, uh, you... Uh, assign the patient, you know, put the patient information into the uh, into the hard drive, and then um, take your handle, uh, assemble it to your probe, and you're in business. And, uh, the image is it's pretty uh, it's pretty immediate. The image capture. And Benji, how much did it cost to get this started? For example, how much was the machine to read it and the probes? Do you have an idea? Uh, probes are about a thousand dollars. Where what what the cost to get this started was, I I I, I don't know here. We've been doing it since um, I want to say 2010 maybe, um, and so we were pretty very early adopters. I I can't remember uh, hearing anything about the cost. I'm sorry for that. Sure. So I want to ask you both, and maybe Charity first, and then Benji. Um, how much are you using ultrasound in the sort of, you know, code setting, patient not doing well or uh, ICU they code or whatever, while everything else is going on, are you guys finding a way to sort of get a probe in and get into the action, and, and, and how does that affect your the way that you run a code? Maybe Charity first. We do use the ultrasound. We don't currently have the Imacore available to us, however. Um, the ultrasound machine is, there is a machine in every ICU, 
and obviously in the trauma bay. So when a person comes in extremis into the trauma bay, it is definitely used as a part of the workup. And then I would say, you know, obviously not immediately in a code on the floor um, because we're obviously doing a lot of other things. But once things kind of settle in, we get a return of circulation, then we will go ahead and, and use the ultrasound to get an idea of what the heart is doing. The code situation is a little tough uh, to, you know, with with the sort of hectic um, array of, you know, care that's being provided. Uh, usually, once there's been some restoration of vital signs, you know, that that's where we would, you know, put a probe down. Um, you know, within the code itself, uh, you know, usually a probe would be, uh, uh, you know, we, we would have to wait till there was yeah. some some survivability there. Okay. Looks like we got a question from the audience here from uh, John Cole. Uh, goal for standard fluid responsiveness is an increase in sy uh, systolic stroke volume with fluid administration. I'm not aware of any studies that describe the sensitivity or specificity of the TEE probe in suggesting fluid responsiveness. How does the TEE probe compare to cheaper modalities such as IJ measurements and VTI? Maybe Benji, you want to take that one? Um, there, there are some studies that sort of uh, compare. Um, uh, the the fluid responsiveness of the vena cava uh, to SVC viewed and and even the IVC view obtained through uh, transabdominal approaches to, um, uh, to to more traditional methods. I, I don't have the reference off the top of my head as it relates to you know what like you know um, CVP has done in the past and but um, but I can't like you know give you that I, I can't give you a direct reference right now. I'm sorry for that. But as it relates to cheaper modalities. Um, I, 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 you know, we've used cheaper modalities in the past, and I feel just anecdotally uh, that this is more accurate. Uh, I've walked into a room where cheaper modalities have also been used, whether it be, you know, someone situated with CVP, for example, uh, and, you know, we put a probe down, and we've, not that CVP is misleading, but uh, we've been surprised with how much more we learned uh, about needs uh, because of the HTE. And is the TE probe measurement that you get, or the visualization, the images, whatever, are they affected by things like high PEEP or high inspiratory pressures like your CVP or your other wedge pressures might be? Yeah, I mean, if you if you are, especially, certainly in your, uh, your your superior vena cava view, uh, if you are on escalate, you know, elevated uh, PEEP, you know, that your vena cava would be a little bit more plump. But, uh, but considering that in your interpretation, that's about it. Uh, another question from the audience here, how much time is needed, this is from Victor Koba, how much time is needed for operator to be trained to be able to use HTE? Um, that's, I don't personally think it's that hard, to be honest with you. Uh, I know they have a uh, clinical specialist that uh, Amacor does that, you know, uh, make it very easy to be honest with you. We, we train residents, we train fellows, they pick it up quite quickly. Um, and uh, once you've Captured once you've practiced capturing the images, uh, the next step is just and as you're learning to capture images, the next step is just conceptual interpretation and uh, and um, it's I don't I don't find it to be difficult. I think it's something that just takes a little bit of runtime and, and um, I think it's something that it's a great tool. I think everybody if they have the interest really ought to give it a, give it a try. Okay. A uh, question from uh, Rich Lesperance. Uh, Charity, benefit of using cardiac view of FAST during initial evaluation of pulseless patient. Do you factor that into deciding whether to terminate or continue resuscitation? We absolutely do. So in a patient um, who comes in with CPR in progress, one of the first things we do as a part of, um, obviously, the ATLS primary survey is to go ahead and look at the heart. If there is not cardiac output, activity there, chances of survival are very, 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 very slim. And so depending on the circumstance, how old, how young, what their reserve, you know, estimated, obviously you don't know the person reserve, is it will make, it will sway us one way or the other. Because if there is no cardiac activity, let's say in a 90-year-old who fell, then yes, we would um, decide to terminate the resuscitation at that point. Um, so yes, we do use it in, in a coding patient. A uh, question from Scott Roth, do you rely on volume responsiveness alone, or is LV filling and RV function important in resuscitation? Um, it's very, uh, LV and RV filling is very important. Um, in fact, uh, you know, the responsiveness alone may not necessarily tell us, you know, what our uh, flow is going to be. I mean, with, with the idea of right-sided uh, dysfunction or function, um, you have to respect the right ventricle because in just, you know, 
15 seconds, you can <laughs> over distend the right ventricle, have very poor right ventricular uh, cardiac wall motion, have very very poor function, and then secondarily, you'll have very poor filling. So I would say that, uh, yeah, RV dysfunction and RV function is, is pretty key, as well as uh, LV function. And I think, honestly, those, th th those functions dictate uh, responsiveness. So. Okay. Well, we're right at 10 after the hour. I, I said promise that we would have to cut things off, unfortunately. Uh, again, I want to thank the kind people at IMACOR for uh, funding this and for making this possible and uh, giving this generous educational grant. Again, I encourage you to go to their webpage. As uh, Benji mentioned, they have some really great resources there to kind of, if you're interested in HTE, they've got some great, uh, I mean, not just specific to the HTE, but also great just echo uh, resources and information there. Um, Again, many thanks to our uh, guests, uh, Dr. Evans and Dr. Christie. Thank you both. It's clear that uh, I personally have a lot of catching up to do when it comes to ultrasound and utilizing it in the uh, care of patients. I'm still so 20th century, apparently. So thank you both for joining us and for doing this. Very much appreciated. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for having and uh, just a reminder, this was brought to you by the East Online Education Committee, and thanks to all those who helped make it possible. We will post the recording of this, both audio and video, on the East webpage, so those who uh, were not able to make it, if you run into the colleagues who might have an interest, uh, direct them to the East webpage and uh, have them look it up. Uh, again, thanks to everyone, and we will stop things there. Take care.